Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Poetry Vlog. Today, we have our first in a longer series with the National Youth Poet Laureate Program, Jackson Neal. Um, Jackson's one of the five finalists and is the Poet Laureate for his particular region. Jackson, will you take a second to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Jackson Neal. I'm the Youth Poet Laureate for the Southwest region of the United States. Uh, I was previously the Youth Poet Laureate for Houston. Uh, I'm a Scorpio. I read lots and lots of books and I write a lot about queer identity, queer theory, drag queens, my father, all of these things. Yeah, I love the juxtaposition of drag queens, my father, and then all of these things. Yep, <laughs> it's perfect. That's perfect. That is perfect. And those are um, them. <laughs> I've never formally said this on the on the vlog before. I'm an Aquarius with various Virgos and Capricorn situations happening. Um, so. so my moon sign and my rising sign are both Aries. So I'm oh. basically a walking matchstick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'm basically a walking ball of determination with weird like pie in the sky dreams. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's how I that's how I read it at least. But anyway, um, why don't we start by having you perform and read for us. Um, for me and or perform or however you want to put it. Um, no. Will you do that for us? Yes. Yeah, of course. Cool. So this is Death Drop from Grace. Left heel buckled in the soft of me, right heel slung like an axe. I shred a hall of boy-shaped mirrors with the teeth of my stiletto. I coax the sun into a crimson pea. Even the wavelengths at my lavish wings will fall to their knees. Incarnating creature, everything is dead to me or ecstasy. Even my god name will shatter when I clack against earth, creature of rhinestone and clavicle, creature of leather and gems. Raining down, a legion of lace-thighed queens will cackle, I'm dead, I'm dead. Faces stretched, so wide they split, heaven runny with the yolk of their lips. Nowhere could be further from death than the brief sky they pepper, not earth, not heaven, not dead, not dead. Only a dazzling slaughter of our names, back arc like horizon, like the sun dropping low. Excellent. Thank, thank you so much. Um, some of the things that stand out to me immediately, actually, are how you use um, internal rhyme and alliteration to sort of recreate the physical impact, right? Like the rhinestones and the crackling and the cartilage and hitting mm -hmm. the earth. Um, and so I end up feeling like I'm kind of along on the ride with you, kind of in and out of these different like embodied experiences in particular. I'm a little bit biased because I already know that you want to talk about haunting today. <laughs> so I was listening for that a little bit. Um, Love it. There was one line. I'm much more of a visual than auditory learner. It was about like yoki lips or lip. Heaven running with the yoke of our lips. I love that. Heaven running with the yoke of our lips. Um, it's so like luscious <laughs> um, and also like disturbing in the best way. Um, I love that. My new author bio, luscious and disturbing. Exactly. That, that's like <laughs> new goals. <laughs> um, and it really creates this like moment where I feel like I'm also in that body, but seeing it at the same time. Like I can picture like in a weird way, like these kind of gross yokey lips, but I also can't picture that. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. I feel like I'm being propelled with it. So it's, it's quite gorgeous. Um, why did you pick this poem today? Well, I picked this poem in part because I did want to talk about drag queens and drag performance yep. um, and specifically how that can relate to this idea of like haunting, um, being haunted by yourself, being haunted by your ancestors. Tell us about how haunting happened for you in the process of creating this piece. Yeah, um, I think about haunting in a lot of different ways. And, I, and I've been reading some scholarly work that, that kind of redefines what it means to be haunted um, in, the, in the way that these ideas such as epigenetic trauma can actually be a means for survival. Uh, so we often think about haunting as these, um, these very traumatic experiences that we have to survive or that we need to escape our haunting. But I, th I think in a really real way, the things that haunt us can be a means for us to kind of transcend our trauma. Um, through a queer lens, that can be difficult because ancestry isn't inherited in the same way that it is in, in other ways. Um, so for me, haunting kind of looks like 
this this notion of the compulsory heteronormative and, and the like the versions of myself that that society would like to depict and would like to see and how I allow those to manifest and, and how they kind of show up uninvited. Uh, so in the process of doing the poem, I'm thinking about all of these moments and I'm also thinking about my horizontal family, all, you know, all my brothers and sisters in the queer community um, that, that experience these things and, and how we move away from that through the experience of joy. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about later today is, is the use of joy as a tool to exercise the things that haunt us. Awesome. Thank you. A couple quick things I want to put a pin in because they're perfect for our vlog followers, actually. Um, Patrick and I just did an episode on queer kinship and queer temporalities. So if you're like, what are you talking about in terms of horizontal family structures and kinship and queer kinship, um, people can refer to some notes on that. So I'll just jump through it to the part where you talk about um, the compulsory kind of hetero performance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's an Audrey Lord reference, which I'm totally biased on your talk today because basically my entire dissertation I is... I love that. I love that. <laughs> colonial poetics as like a haunting method for pleasure. So I'm like way biased um, yeah, in wow. the topic. So I'm going to work on de-jargoning it for our viewers. Mm -hmm. What is that term? Like, how did you come to it? Where does it come from? What do you mean me talk about like a sort of compulsory heteronormativity and how you see your relay with that? Yeah, so so kind of one of the ways I've come to understand w what that language means is that in a society that's formed, and it's been like a very patriarchal society that pushes these cisnormative, heteronormative structures on us, uh, the assumption is when you enter a room that you are a straight cis body. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that can be a real kind of violence, right? To, to immediately erase your identity without any kind of notion about who you are, what your experiences are. Um, so to escape from that, to, to really take pride and take joy in like your own identity is a real struggle, I think, for a lot of queer people. Um, especially when, when there are some notions within the community that performing masculinity or performing heteronormativity is something to be congratulated. Um, a lot of times gay men will give compliments of saying, oh, you look so masked or you look so butch. Um, yeah. So even within the community, we've kind of internalized this, this understanding that to be straight presenting or to be masculine presenting is something that we should strive for. Yeah, yeah. Which is also perfect timing. I just interviewed my student the other day on um, the problem in trans communities with compulsory masculinity and like the kind of violence of having to assume certain masculine attributes. Um, and if you're not, you're not performing your transness enough is what they were talking about. Um, and I was also thinking of Bell Hook's work as well about like toxic masculinity being something we can internalize um, and have to keep performing to keep playing out these spaces. So Perfect. The other part I want to put a pin in because it's now going to help us move on to what you brought today is I agree that haunting can actually be a mode of pleasure, right? We think of haunting as like pain, as loss, and oftentimes a lot of our marginalized identities end up therefore being only tied to pain and loss. Um, but something that Audre Lorde is very invested in, right, as well as a lot of like activist queer poets is this idea of like pleasure and play and you're noting how drag can offer that through haunting, right, and kinship. So talk a little bit about the other materials you brought and how else you're thinking about that in your own work. No. So I brought in two materials that I kind of want to look at side by side today. Uh, two of them are poems and visuals that were made by Diana Coy Wynn in, in her recent book, Ghost Of. Um, mm -hmm. And in this book, she navigates a poetics of loss, specifically thinking about the loss of her brother. Um, and this is a very familial kind of haunting that that can be understood through that lens of trauma. But I, th I think the way that family comes up in this book and in these poems is also leaning towards this idea of using haunting as a source of strength and, and as, a, as a kind of pleasure in the sense that, that it can be pleasurable to heal and it can be pleasurable to, to find community with each other. Uh, the second piece of uh, material that I brought in today is some videos and songs by the, Braz the Brazilian drag artist Pablo Vitar. Uh, two of Pablo's songs, In the Thruvial and Open Bar. 
uh, navigate kind of a queer celebration and queer haunting in a way that I think speak really interestingly to Diana Coy Wynn's work. This idea that as queer people, we can be haunted by our past selves, but also how do we how do we then use that haunting as a source of strength and as a source of pleasure to, to move away from trauma and, and to use it as, as a way of transcending these places that we've been put in? Yeah. And I would um, note for our viewers and listeners that are English majors, <laughs> we're not saying transcending in the sense of like getting beyond your body into some like ethereal realm no. or, or whatever. <laughs> By transcending, you mean sort of like no longer being confined to only identifying yourself through and with that, but rather being able to create um, and sort of offer proliferative otherness, right? Yes. Thank you. That's okay. very, very Just making sure Because I can hear like committee chairs in my dissertation room being like, what do you mean by transcendence? Ah, <laughs> <so good. laughs> the trap of cultural studies. Why did you have us watch or if you listen to the podcast, listen to those particular performances? Or can you point to specific details that for you create this sort of like performance of haunting? Yeah. Um, I think Industrial interrogates or, or, navigates haunting in the more traditional sense that we understand it. Um, this is a song that kind of explores the way that, that Pablo grew up and, and some of the traumas that he experienced in navigating gender and, per, and performance. Um, mm-hmm. But what I love is that when you translate the lyrics, um, the reoccurring line is, I know that everything will be okay and these wounds will heal. I know that everything will be okay. Right? And so in the composition... As opposed to the video, uh, what is haunting these lines is this idea of healing. Um, yeah. Like what keeps coming up and what is inescapable in that experience is this idea of, of healing from from this experience that Pablo went through. Um, and in that way, I, I think we can understand how haunting is a source of strength. To know that I have survived this and I am capable of surviving this and that you know, my wounds have healed. And that's how I know that I can continue to progress. The video ends with uh, Pablo himself on stage or Pablo herself on stage in drag, you know, kind of witnessing where they have gone, where where they have emerged after this experience. So I think the video of In the Throville really does a tremendous job of, of exemplifying it, the way that you can use your haunting to lead you somewhere. It's, it's not purely residing in a reflection. It doesn't, the video doesn't take place. The song doesn't take place completely in the past tense. It, yeah. We move through time, and by the end of the video, uh, we see Pablo and, and where she has arrived. And I, and I think that's so lovely. Yeah. Um, I think this also surfaces a little bit in your own poem because the tense is a sort of like wavering present Like it sort of Mm -hmm. goes in and out of the future, present, and past a little bit to the point where we're sort of caught up in a moment. Um, And I think that that like use of tense in poetry can be especially profound when you're thinking through haunting methodologies or like the use of tense in performance as a poetics, right? Because it's sort of like saying we're not going to grieve it as if it's in the past and we can now say it's a closed chapter, but we're also not going to be like ruled by this or like kind of determined by it. Right. It's kind of like a sort of a healing can happen without necessarily saying like it doesn't have its vestiges in the present. Um, Absolutely. absolutely. Um, And that's that's kind of the lens through which I I was watching and listening Open Bar, which is a much more celebratory. um, It's this really, really fantastic experience of of Pablo being surrounded by other drag artists um, in, in just this fantastic celebration. But also what is held in that notion of being surrounded by other drag artists is that in some way they have each experienced the things that we watched in India Throbiel. You know, like all of these drag artists have to have come from backgrounds that are similar or to at least understand the kinds of haunting that Pablo discusses in the, in the previous video. Yeah. And so in that way, like this shared haunting, this shared gathering um, it is a way to, to, you know, harness that haunting in a celebratory way. And it's a, a really, really explicitly pleasurable way that's, that I think is just so incredible. Thank you. Um, there's so much there. I don't even know where to start. If you're viewing and watching, there'll be a reading list for you at the end. So you can research more deeply on this. 
Um, Jackson, you sent me another poem and it was an image of the poem. Would you mind reading that for us as well today? Uh, so I brought two poems in. One is a lot more visual heavy, but the first poem uh, is called Family Ties. Gradually, a girl's innocence itself becomes her major crime. A doe and her two fawns bent low in the sumac along the bank of the highway, the pinched peach of their ears twitching in the heat. Into this disordered evening, my brother cut out only his face from every photograph in the hall carefully slipping each frame back into position. What good does it do? Decades of no faces other than our own chipping faces. What good does it do? This resemblance to nothing we know of the dollhouse. New parents watch their newborn resting in a sunny patch of an empty room, the newborn at making sense of its container. And from the road, a deer ripened in death and a tuft of fur or dandelion tumbled along gently circled, driftwood, shaking loose, gathered, dissolving into the mouths of jewelweed nearby. Earth is rife with iron and blood is rich in stardust. Immediately I spotted one hoof print, then nothing, as if this was where she dragged herself out of the body, strips of tire torn from their orbit. It is right then that we are left to hurdle alone. Hmm. Why did you pick that poem for today? So I was reading Ghost of by Diana Quaywin, which this poem Family Ties come from. Um, and the book is fantastic because it, it uses a really incredible use of visuals. Um, throughout, throughout the book, there are photographs of Diana Quaywin's family and specifically photographs that her brother, who is past, um, was in. And in each spot where her brother was, um, he's cut out. And it wasn't until I got to this poem um, with the line, into the disordered evening, my brother cut out only his face from every photograph in the hall. It wasn't until that we arrive at that line that it becomes clear each of these photographs in which the brother is missing it was done by his own hand. Um, I quite lit I was reading this in the dining hall of the University of Houston, and I started like I started breaking down in tears. Like, yeah, just I'm trying not to cry right now. Into yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. So and then you know it changes the whole shape of the book to know that she is taking this this action that her brother has done unto himself and making a poetics of it. Um, and in that, you know, in that way, like, really, really allowing yourself to be haunted by your own brother um, is, is incredible. I, I think opening oneself up to that haunting and embracing it for, for the pain and joy that it, that it can be in a very like, multitudinous way um, is, is just brilliant. Um, and so when, when we get to the line... Decades of no faces other than our own shipping faces. Um, you know, most obviously this is, this is about the actual loss of the brother's face. But also, you know, as I'm thinking about the ghost of ourselves and, and thinking about this through a queer lens, like your own face really does become something that haunts you as a queer yep. person. You know, um, in, you know, recent years, I started presenting a lot more effeminately in public, um, just in terms of like clothing and how like what I put on my face. Um, and, and, you know, in that way, sometimes I look in the mirror and like, it is a ghost of myself. Um, I'm like, who is this person? Um, and the face that other people associate with me, you know, yeah. I have family members and I have close friends that maybe have not seen my face in an effeminate frame. Um, and in that way, I, I, my face only exists in the masculine to certain people. That's a yeah. kind of ghost in, in the way that, that my own face haunts me via other people's experience. Yeah. And what I love about this too, to um, go back to the vlog's kind of cheesy hope practice, is that haunting is such a great example of how like allowing yourself to be haunted by these past selves and past relationships is like the only pathway towards an actionable hope, like a sort of creating or performing and becoming. Wow. You know? I really love that. Yeah. I'm glad wow. you love that. <laughs> cool. I'm, not cry I'm not crying, I swear. <laughs> yeah, but it's, the yeah. There are no tears in my eyes. <laughs> but it's true. Um, 
And uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that you, you talk about it in terms of queerness, right? Because I think people think it's, it's oftentimes reduced to the binaristic transness versus queerness, right? Like the queer community is so guilty of reproducing so many binaries, both in terms of sexuality and gender, because we're so rooted in that system. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's sometimes we forget that what queerness offers is the ability to have these other selves come out and play. You know, it kind of calls attention in a very hyper way to the different versions we put on of ourselves always and that everyone is doing, you know. Um, so I really appreciate how when you're looking at haunting, you're not just thinking about how we're haunted by fill in the blank of someone else, but also ways that we're haunted by these different performances of self that we put on, right? Or these different selves that we are as they're in flux over time, because it's a really, I think, a very hopeful thing to sort of reckon with the fact that you can be in flux and have these different presentations and also these different interiorities over time. Um, so there's a perfect poem for it too, because it's so visual. Because when I'm talking about sounds abstract, it's the opposite of abstract. <laughs> it's actually very yeah, concrete. Uh -huh. you know? um, now I know we're running a little bit shorter on time. You sent me two poems. Um, yeah. Do you want to read the second one as well? So to viewers, I don't know how clearly this is going to come up, but this is how the poem looks. And if you're listening on the podcast, the image is a locket um, from Diana Coywin's family. And it's of her, her sister, and there's a hole where her brother's picture ought to be. Um, the image is laid twice, so it's once completely... Um, as it is, and then there's a transparency over it. So the image itself takes on a very ghostly quality. And then in the shape of the hole where the brother ought to be is the poem itself. Um, the name of the poem is Kyotaku, which is an ancient Japanese form of copying the image of fish onto paper using ink. Okay. Um, and, and so this is the poem Kyotaku from Ghost of. Sound itself can be a form of violence escapable only in death. It passes through walls. It rushes in. It pierces but does not touch. The victim bears no marks on his body. The body moved by sound, moved to leave. It leaves no trace. There are two sisters. Who are the two sisters? Null at the intersection of his music and violence. It saturates a space, audire, Abdire, stay. Mm. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for doing the labor of describing it for our podcast listeners. Um, so before we leave, I'm going to start crying now. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really moving. <laughs> really moving. All right. Uh, before we leave, <laughs> why, why did you pick this poem as well of, from this particular book? Um, I... In a way, I picked it because I, I wanted to put it in, into conversation with song again, this poem that's so enraptured with the idea of sound. Um, and in the poem, sound, sound is a form of violence. Um, and, and sound is one of the ways that, that the speaker can be haunted by their traumas. But with that in mind, I, I think it's important to note that as we've been watching and listening Pablo Vitar's videos, that is a sound that is also haunting um, in, in a manner that's very joyful. Um, the sound of the people we love is something that's inescapable, you know. Um, I often <laughs> sometimes hear my mother's voice in, like, my friends or in just people around me. That's something that doesn't leave you. Um, and the way that that voice can haunt you, uh, <laughs> the way that that voice can haunt you, I think, can do a lot of work depending on how you allow it to move through you. Yeah like a couple quick connections for folks that follow the project more regularly. Um, this builds very directly on queer temporalities and kinship, right? Because when you don't exist in this kind of linear heteroreproductive state, you have to find and exist in these other versions of time, right? So haunting is something that's like very near and dear to queer communities. And the same exists for racialized and diasporic communities that don't get to have that sort of like myth of linear nation bound time as well. So for folks who want to talk more about this or hear more about this, um, again, Patrick and I talk about it through DA Powell's poems and then Sarah Dowling talked about it and talking about diaspora 
but there's another one, um, Lucia Lorenzi is a scholar who all of her work is on sound and memory and haunting and like the power of silence. She was the first distance guest I ever had. The quality is garbage, but the audio is fine. So <laughs> it was like way back in September, but um, I'll, I'll tag her when yours goes up too. So you two can maybe also chat because her work is really powerful and yeah. I have a feeling you'd really connect with that. Um, all right. And then... I think I'm going to stop there because my brain's exploding and we're out of time. Um, is there anything that we didn't mention today that you're like, wait, I really wanted to plug this one thing while I'm on air? Um, check out National Youth Poet Laureate results in April. Um, all of the finalists are incredible, amazing, talented poets and activists. And Urban Word has been organizing so, so amazingly. Uh, shout out to Dr. Camille Davis, the national director, for doing all of this work. Um, and thank you so much for listening. Yeah. Yep, Camille Davis. Actually, we learned about this while we were doing our episode because I had no idea she was involved in the program. Um, so, so many like gratitude feelings for her incredible willingness to be in coalition and do the work in the labor to center youth poet voices. Um, and we're gonna have the other four finalists on here as well. But finalists or not, there is a strong competition. Like, it's really more of like a cohort of amazingly talented activist poets. Um, we're gonna have a webinar in April of all of you together actually when you have your big gathering. So that'll be a lot of fun. It's gonna be weird for me. I mean, like I've met all of you individually, now you're all together. Um, I'll probably start crying again. All right, everyone else that's listening, um, if you're watching the YouTube version, go check out the podcast version. And in the podcast only, you'll hear Jackson reading for you all week in the flash briefings. We don't have those on YouTube and they're just two minutes a day. So you can go check those out there. I get a lot why they're called flash briefings and I hate mentioning it because it sounds like product placement thing so if you have an Alexa you can say hey Alexa it's my poetry reading flash briefing and then the poetry vlogs flash briefing podcasts will play for you so that was what those are designed for um once again not endorsing the product not saying you should buy from Amazon not saying I own it but that's the reason they're called flash briefings so go check out Jackson there I also want to note that when guests come on here it's really vulnerable so if you could leave a comment or if you could go ping Jackson on social media and be like, hey, thanks for being so vulnerable and sharing your thoughts and your work, that would go a really long way towards building a more sustainable community. And then finally, I'm creating a newsletter that will send updates on what's happening for people who have been on the vlog. So sign up for that. If you sign up for it intentionally versus you just happen to be on it because they're one of my contacts anyway, I'll send you a snail mail gift as well because snail mail trumps email any day. All right. Everything else is the usual. Follow at the poetry vlog. Follow Jackson on social media. Check out his website. All of the information is linked in the description. And I think that's it, right? I think we're good. I think we're good. All right. Thanks again, Jackson. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>